All right, if everyone wants to have a seat, we'll get going on our last panel of the day. So this panel is for one hour. It's the new canola threats panel. So we'll have four presenters and they'll come up and give their presentation. About 15 minutes for the first one, about 10, 10 and 10 for the next. And then we'll bring them all back up for a panel discussion at the end. So if you think of questions while they're presenting, just jot them down and then we'll give you a chance to ask all those questions during the panel discussion. Um, before I get going also, um, housekeeping note, there is a phone that was found. <laughs> so if, you're, if you don't have your phone and you lost your phone, it's in kind of like a mint green case. Um, they've got it at the registration table. So um, yeah, if you're missing your phone, go pick that up. All right. Um, so I should introduce myself. I'm Taryn Dixon. I'm the resource manager with the Canola Council of Canada. And I'm also a member of the Canola Week organizing committee and, of course, your chair for this last session. So the first speaker um, in the panel is Dr. Tyler Wist. Tyler is a f field crop entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon. And Tyler will present on Aster Yellows and current research. Well, sorry about the most uninspiring title I've ever come up with, but maybe somebody else came up with it for me. So did you know that we just had the worst Aster Yellows year in recorded history? Thanks to WGRF and SAS Canola. I can say that because we had money to be out there monitoring the leaf hoppers that arrived. So let's talk about that year, but let's talk about what led up to it. So we got these projects because I kept saying another Aster Yellows year is coming. 2012, this big outbreak in 2012, caught the industry, I think, in Western Canada here completely off guard. And we had a lot of Aster Yellows in the canola fields. So we came up with a couple of projects. Better prediction of Aster Yellows risk each year by monitoring leafhopper arrivals and winds. So I colloquially called this one my AY Winds project. The next one, Sean Prager was leading it and I was helping out on it. The role of plant hosts in the outbreak of aster leafhopper vectored aster yellows. So I call this one AY weeds. And that's how I have them listed and filed in my, in my filing system. So a couple of projects. And the team that we assembled, uh, myself, so I started working on the leafhoppers in September of 2012, right after that big outbreak. And I was working for Christelle Olivier. So she had been working with Aster Yellows and Leafhoppers since, uh, since the 2001 when she started. We got Keith Hobson, brought him in for some stable isotope techniques. Tim DeMonso at Ag Canada did, uh, did some really cool things. And I'll tell you a bit about the new detection methods for Aster Yellows in both plants and Leafhoppers. And then Sean Prager, I just said that he likes phloem sucking vectors, and so he's on, on the project too. So here's our, here's our little vector. This is Macrostelis quadrilineatus. Perhaps I'm saying that wrong. Last time I sat down and had a drink with a taxonomist, they said, well, you should be pronouncing it Macrostelis. And so I don't drink with taxonomists anymore. But this little leafhopper brings in aster yellows, and so it is a phytoplasma disease. So this is a, a weird little bacteria with a terrible cell wall, but they're obligate parasites. So people thought that they were, were viruses because you can't culture them. But there they are in the phloem cells of a plant, and uh, yeah, this causes aster yellows. So what they do in canola is they, they play with the hormones and turn the plant into super weird looking things. And then the leaf hopper picks them up. So that's our acquisition phase. And then about four weeks later, they become infectious when the phytoplasma goes back to their salivary, or goes to their salivary glands and they can inject it into another plant. Then you get canola that looks super weird. And I like to say super cool, just like that there. And so there's our old friend Macrostelis, Macrostelis feeding on a plant. And so they'll tap into a plant for quite some time when they find the phloem. 
and they inject that phytoplasma. So most years, the incidence of Aster yellow is in the field, and I'll tell you, incidence, uh, you disease people probably know all about this, is number of fields that were surveyed that have this disease in it. So there's a super cool canola plant, and it's all green, while the rest of the field is certainly not green. 2000, there was an incidence of about 2 to 15%. 2007 was an outbreak year, 2 to 25%. 2012, incidence was up to 64%. And so why are these different? We're probably looking at the, the uh, different provinces and the incidence in the different provinces. So I kept saying, it's coming, it's coming, and the 2023 happened. And so final year of our project funding, we got the Astro Yellows outbreak that I've always wanted, where we had about 65% incidence. So that's 65% of surveyed fields had Astro Yellows in it. Now, prevalence is the other thing that they look at. So this is someone going on a blind transect, picking 100 plants randomly and saying, does it have Astro Yellows or not? And our prevalence was only about 1.6% across all the fields. And thanks very much to Carter Peru. I've got his name there. And uh, Sask Agriculture for doing all of this work and then sharing it with me. And then in those fields that had Astro Yellows, 4.8%. So that doesn't seem like an absolute tragedy, does it, Tyler? Uh, 2012 was much worse than that in the canola fields. So if I don't get to it, maybe ask me why. Let's talk about this leaf hopper. So if I put these things in the freezer for longer than three minutes, they die. So they can't do very well in the cold. So they migrate up each year. We didn't really know where exactly they were coming from. So this is what the AY Winds project was about. Now there are another 11 leafhopper species that can vector aster yellows, but kind of like Dan Johnson was talking about with the grasshoppers, this is our main one because it builds up to big populations. So when the leafhoppers get here, our old technique was called nested PCR. Somebody published that this is ultra sensitive. That was actually in the title. And so when we tried to come up with something that was more sensitive than ultra sensitive, the reviewers were like, well, how could you be more sensitive than ultra sensitive? But we were an order of magnitude more sensitive. And so what you're seeing on the top graph there, those lines are individual leaf hoppers. Whereas with nested PCR, we needed three to five leaf hoppers just to get enough DNA. So if you can imagine uh, the difference in sensitivity now that we're looking at one leaf hopper. Down on the bottom there is a colorometric reaction where manganese precipitates and Tim DeMonso had come up with this and our, our uh, PhD student Carolina sort of perfected it and did all of the work. And that paper there in 2020 got downloaded over 10,000 times before the end of that year was out. And so it was, uh, it was a pretty cool time for us all. Now. What's even more cool is nested PCR takes you about a week. That's your turnaround time. And this new lamp technique you can get done in about a half an hour. So if you are a grower and you want an, an immediate answer, we have that available now. And so I kept saying to Tim, yo, we need the recipe, Tim. And he's like, how about this? Gave this to me yesterday and I texted him back a face plant like this. I was like, so you've had this for how long? Because um, obviously we need to get this into the hands of more people. So um, the objectives then, and are still watching the winds, where are they coming from each year? And if they come from different places, that, does that mean that the Astra Yellows is going to be different? Our Astra Yellows risk going to be different? So we tried three different methods. We looked at the winds, we looked at population genetics, and we looked at stable isotopes, which I'll tell you a bit more about. So we wanted to understand if there were different risk areas in those migratory regions. So the first hypothesis, they come all the way from Mexico, Texas, straight up in one big migration. Another one, leapfrog migration. They come up, they have a generation in Nebraska, Kansas area, and then they come up into Canada. And this one is, who knows where they're coming from, but let's try to figure it out. They could be coming from anywhere and uh, blowing up in on the winds. So could be different host plants and have different AY risks. So population genetics kind of fell flat. It seemed like 
These things were a genetic mixing pot and there was no population structure, but there's Carolina looking very scientific-y in her lab coat. And so we went to stable isotopes. So stable isotopes, uh, I think they were looking at, originally this was done with migratory birds. And so you look at the heavy hydrogen ratio, so the deuterium to protium ratio, which is heavy hydrogen is deuterium. And we had lots of fun getting enough leaf hoppers to do one sample. So we worked with Keith and my technician, Nancy, dubbed this stuff fairy dust. So you pull off the metabolically inactive part of the insect, which on a 2.3 millimeter long leaf hopper are tiny little wings and tiny little legs. And if you sneeze, you've lost your sample. So that's the fairy dust. And you can see that the bars here are different lengths. And so the longer the bars, the more northerly the sample. So here are our residents that grew up in Saskatchewan and their ratio is down around negative 200. And so in the various years, we had shorter bars. And so obviously they were coming from further south. How far south were they coming? Still looking at the data, but we're using these NOAA high split models that the uh, US puts out for us. And then we put out a whole bunch of sticky cards to try to get that first arrival of the leaf hoppers. So thanks again to the government of Saskatchewan, the Sask Ministry, uh, people who are out there monitoring sticky cards for us, along with diamondback moth traps. And so then we get to these, these winds. And so those little dots that you see on the map, that's where the winds got down to about five meters from the ground. So think of the leaf hoppers getting on the bus at that point, riding the winds up. And this is 2019. We didn't have a whole lot of leaf hoppers. And they came up and they were barely infected with aster yellows. So not a whole lot of aster yellows in 2019 because of that. We look at the stable isotope ratio and it basically matches where the winds came from. So I was so happy in 2019 to see that. 2020, we actually had a lot of leafhoppers migrate up, but they weren't very infected. And we didn't have a big aster yellows year in 2020 because, you know, the guns came up, but they weren't loaded, let's say. And there's some of the winds, and you can see them stretching down, um, kind of supporting that two-step hypothesis that they're coming up from here and having a generation. And so what goes on there right around the May long weekend is what I was trying to figure out. And it is winter wheat production, where the crop is starting to senesce. And by the first week in June, they're cutting that crop. And so I think that is our driver for migration each year. So there's some more winds from 2020. And each of these up here represents the sticky card catches. So we did have some sticky cards that over a week caught over 200 leaf hoppers, which is quite a lot, but they just weren't very infected. And the winds, they're down around the ground here. And so here, down below the Dakotas, and that is potentially where they were coming up from. 2020 though, we kind of had winds that were just from all over the place. So this really muddies the water when you've got a one week collection period and you're trying to catch all these guys. Um, and so what that wound up looking like was this weird isotopic isoscape where it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. So yeah, maybe they were coming from here, but they could have been coming from a lot of other places as well, which potentially speaks to multiple migrations. Here's 2021, it was a little more cut and dried there. Um, we shall not speak of 2020, I think I may have. Um, but this was one of the projects that we actually were able to keep doing in 2020. And these ones here, the, the isotopic ratio looked pretty good for where the winds were coming from. And then we get to 2023. And so we went to a roadside survey. We wanted to really tighten things up so that we could look at more like individual days, not every single day, what did the winds look like? And so um, this was the 23rd, and so May long weekend again. So take home message could be that um, I get leaf hoppers on my birthday every year, and so does Queen Victoria. So if you're wondering about leaf hoppers, that's when we start to look for them, and then we can use our method to smash them up and quickly figure things out. And so this is the percent that we're positive. So we had a lot of samples there that were really positive. So um, we had enough leaf hoppers that we could look at in a few places, like 100 leaf hoppers was a subsample. And right around Saskatoon, um, on the block 22 um, 
I guess they were hanging out in Dandelion, which is a whole other AY weed story. But they were infected at a, a rate of, six, of 61%. Um, some other places were 35%. And in 2012, we happened to have some samples and they were not infected um, beyond 10% to that whole population. So they don't just come into canola. Um, here's canola right here. And if you notice what we got going on in canola is there are no nymphs. So nymphs are on the red bars. They don't reproduce in canola. They don't reproduce in peas, but they will go into those crops, but in small numbers in canola. So what the heck are they doing in canola is one of the research questions I'm still trying to answer. But there's barley, there's oats, there's wheats, and they reproduce in those. And in 2012, we had dead white wheat heads. And in 2023, we also had dead white wheat heads and awns that were just starting to stick out as these things were, were dropping like flies in the field. So dead white wheat heads versus um, what you should see in the field. I got contacted by cut flower growers and she basically lost her whole crop to aster yellows in Northern Alberta. Uh, carrot growers in the same region, 50% yield loss of carrots and right, that's a sunflower that's totally messed up. She sent me pictures of about 28 different species, that's straw flower and messed up. So Keith said I couldn't talk about flea beetles, but here's some flea beetles in these pictures. And what we're doing is training artificial intelligence to count flea beetles, but we're also trying to do it for leaf hoppers so that I can then tighten up that sampling to more like one hour, because this thing takes a picture every hour, counts the flea beetles, and that's that allele isothiocyanate trap that uh, they were talking about. So thanks to Nancy, my technician, Kevin Cardinal for doing those isoscapes. Um, everybody in Saskatchewan for hosting Traps and Carter and the people who are funding the work who are in the room. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Tyler, both for a great presentation and for staying on time. Uh, so now for our next speak speaker, we'll now hear from Christine Nerona, a research scientist in uh, entomology and IPM at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Charlottetown Research and Development Centre in PEI. Christine's pre presentation is called The Pollen Beetle, What You Need to Know About It. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to come and speak at this forum. Um, today, I'm going to just discuss what we are doing with the pollen, what research we are doing with the pollen beetles, and what we have found out since I started in 2012. Okay, so let's begin with what are pollen beetles. So they're very tiny bronzed beetles that feed on the pollen of many different plants. Uh, they're, they're native to Europe, and in Europe they have two species, Brassicogathes aeneas and Brassicogathes viridescens. Viridescens is the only one that we have here, and thankfully it's the one that has only one generation. So um, it's, it's, it's a very different beetle because the adult skin feed on pollen from many different plants, but the larvae can only survive on brassicas. So it has to lay, lay its eggs on brassicas. So we think that it came in all along the Atlantic coast and in, um, first identified in Nova Scotia in, 19, in 1967. And then in 1996 and beyond, we started to see it spreading into other areas, into other, other provinces, and now it's in PEI, New Brunswick, and Quebec. So in 2006, a paper was published on the climate change and pollen beetle movement. It was looking at many different other species as well. At that time, you will see that the term mel Melagethes viridescens, it was called Melagethes, and then they changed it. The taxonomist changed it to Brass Brassicogethes now. So the, the model showed that there, there's going to be, as, as temperatures go up, there's going to be an increase in the movement and the abundance of this pest. And in 2012, I went to a field in, 
in uh, PEI, and there were just so many beetles, and the farmer had no clue that because he, he could see the yellow flowers, but he didn't know that there were beetles there until I took him, and all his fields had, uh, had pollen beetles in it. So I decided, well, you know, we don't know anything about this beetle in Canada, so let's just be proactive and start working on it and finding out more about it. So first, the life cycle. So it, the adults come out in the spring and they feed on flowers. They hang around the, the, the canola uh, area where the canola fields are, and they'll just feed on flowers, uh, pollen from flowers. Then as soon as the canola starts to form uh, buds, the green buds, they move into the canola and they lay their eggs inside the bud. The larvae hatch, they'll feed in the bud on the pollen, and in, while doing so, they also damage other parts of the bud. They'll, they'll um, molt and then form the second instar larva. This second instar will go out, come out of the buds, and then it will feed on the flowers of all the, move from flower to flower feeding on the pollen. And then it pupates, and then uh, after pupation, falls to the ground, pupates, comes out, and then it uh, becomes an adult again. It comes out as an adult, and this adult overwinters. So the damage. This is very interesting, the type of damage they do, because they go into the green buds. So you can see here, um, they are, there's several beetles that are on the green buds. In the, the, one of the pictures, you can see actually a beetle sticking out of the bud because they make, they chew their way into the bud. And you can see at the bottom pictures where there are holes in the bud, so they chew their way into the bud. They'll go in and they lay their eggs there. So this is what happens to the, to the flower once the, uh, the larva actually feeding inside the bud. So they, the, the flower kind of doesn't, doesn't open and doesn't look really good. It, it kind of dries out. Yeah, in the other picture, you see the second instar larva that's feeding on, the, on the, um, the pollen of open flowers. What happens is the, the buds fall off. And then all you get are, if you look at this picture here, you see these little stubs. These were supposed to be these stubs here. They're actually supposed to be um, uh, pods, but they're no pods because the flowers have fallen off, and that's how you get uh, a yield reduction. Okay, so we wanted to to find out if the damage to the buds equates to the number of larvae in the in the in the the buds. Act, actually, they are in the buds. So we collected about 800. Um, um, little buds every week, and we looked at them, and we found that there was a positive correlation. So they're just not feeding on the, they're just not making those holes. They're actually going in and laying eggs inside the buds. Well, we decided to look at um, the life cycle and correlate that with the, with the growth stages of the canola plants. And what we found was that, as you can see here, um, oops, sorry. How do I go back? Okay. All right. You can see that we, we plant the seeds. They come out. There's the first instar. They start. You start to see them. But as soon as this, you start to see the first buds, that's when you start to see egg laying and first instar larvae. You start to see the eggs. At 10% bloom, the eggs are peaking, and then you start to see all the second instar larvae. And around this time, they start to come out as adults you start to see the adults coming out. So it's very correlated with the, the, the blooming time of the canola. So that was really good. And we have the degree days, because it was a degree day model. We wanted to see how long it takes and what degree days are required. So they come out fairly early. And they'll be just sitting around, going to different flowers and hanging around the canola, canola field. We looked at thresholds, wanted to see what was, what was happening. And for the thresholds, uh, we did these large gauge trials. And we also added um, bees to the cage just to make sure that there was pollination happening within the cage. We looked at zero uh, pollen beetles, seven and nine pollen beetles. 
and what we found was definitely at nine pollen beetles, you had f uh, uh, more missing pods, and the total number of pods formed was also significantly lower. There was something happening with the number of pollen beetles, so that is approximately the threshold that we are looking at right now. We also had uh, a reduction in the seed weight. We, we wanted to look at insecticides, it's a way to control these. In Europe, they're having a big problem there because they're, they're developing resistance to the insecticides. But because they're present during the pollination, uh, during the flowering period, we wanted to look at uh, insecticide that had a lower impact on pollinators. So those are the four that we chose. We use the IRAC procedure and hope this works. So uh, here's the high rate that I'm showing you. I hope it works and you will see. In the controls, you can see the, the beetles moving around. You'll also see some beetles towards the end in the belief that there are some beetles that are, low, were, were, that are walking around, so we know that belief doesn't work as well as the other three insecticides. So when we look at the, the graph here, it shows you that belief it gives you some control, but not as much. But the other insecticides do give you quite, quite a good level of control, except for Savanta Prime, where it's a little bit reduced, but at the low, at the medium and low rates. Uh, we look for attractiveness for varieties. And um, so it's interesting. We do find some varieties are more attractive than others. Uh, we're still working through the data and trying to figure things out. But that's not a bad thing, because if you have a very attractive variety, it can always be used as a trap crop. And then you have the insecticides, so you spray that trap crop instead of spraying the entire field. So I'm trying to hurry up through this. I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> um, so we have been doing surveillance ever since I started working on this, right throughout, the, throughout Canada. And so I work with um, Hector Carcamo from uh, Alberta. Tyler West is, is part of this. Um, John Gavlowski and Megan Moran from, uh, from Ontario. So we've been doing this survey. We want to see, are they really moving? What's going on? So far, I haven't seen any. I'm trying to, um, I'm looking at these. You can see that they're still only present here. In Quebec, they're doing a lot of damage to the crop. Um, I'm getting some samples from Megan. I haven't received them yet. I'm looking at them. I got a sample from John Gavlowski, but it wasn't pollen beetles. So I was happy about that. But I think monitoring needs to continue. We need to continue this surveillance because it's important to know when it's coming here. So we, over the years, we have gotten a lot of information about this insect. So uh, I think going into the future, at least we have more information than what we did about uh, eight, seven, eight years ago. So I'd like to thank my team and all the, um, the funding agencies, and thanks for inviting me. I hope I kept on time. Thanks so much for that presentation. Next up is Dr. Boyd Morey from the University of Alberta. Boyd is an assistant professor and NSERC industrial research chair in agricultural entomology in the Department of Agricultural Food and Nutritional Science at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. Boyd will, Boyd will present with his own title. <laughs> Keith, you messed up my title. Um, all right, so thanks very much for the invitation and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about the canola flower midge. Um, and following my presentation, you'll also have a presentation on the Swede midge. Um, but this isn't work that I do alone. And so this has been work led by a team of us, including speaker from yesterday, Dr. Megan Van Koski, uh, Dr. Julie Soroka, who really started this work uh, back in 2012 in Saskatchewan. Uh, a former postdoc of mine, Aaron Campbell, who's now at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency here in Alberta, uh, Shelley Barkley and Scott Mears, 
um, who were instrumental in helping us find this uh, species here in this province, and then current research being conducted my, by my PhD student, Kyle Van Camp. So, the canola flower midge. I like to think of this idyllic canola field, maybe you're in the Parkland region, and you start to zoom in, you look a little close and you see maybe some curly pods from uh, thrips, and then you look a little closer and you start seeing some darker yellow flowers, and if we just highlight some of those, um, these are galled flowers uh, caused by this insect. Um, and this is a new species, new to science. Uh, we described it in, well, officially in 2019. Um, we actually positively identified it in 2016. Uh, it is not the Swede midge, um, so the one that keeps Keith up at night. Uh, it is not this one. Uh, and we can confirm that so far the Swede midge has not been found on the prairies. Um, and let's, let's keep it that way, and with Janet's help, uh, also know it's not in North Dakota. But the canola flower midge, why does it get its name? Um, it creates these galls, so it's a cecidomyid midge, these are gall-forming midges. The saliva that they secrete, the larvae secrete, uh, onto the growing canola plant will manipulate the plant and cause this deformation, and it basically prevents these flowers from opening. Uh, and so the larvae are living inside there um, through three different instars and, of course, then reducing your overall yield. We know it's widely distributed across the prairies. Um, in 20, between 2017 and 2019, we did an extensive driving survey looking for damage uh, throughout the prairie, so all the way up into the Peace, down into uh, right along the border in Manitoba, and we basically found it everywhere we went. We also didn't find it in a lot of spots, but it was pretty prevalent. It's still like finding a needle in a haystack in a lot of fields, uh, but once you have the search image for it, you can probably go out into your field this summer and be able to find one or two infested flowers, unfortunately. Um, but inf infested flowers, um, the reason Keith is kept up at night from Swede midge is because it can attack more plant parts than just flowers. Uh, the canola flower midge, infests flowers, and in a second we'll talk about maybe some other plant parts that can infest. But if you were to open up those flowers, you can see here, um, there's a little larvae right at the bottom. Uh, this, you can see damage, this hypersensitive response along the pistil of this plant, um, trying to kill off the canola flower midge, but unfortunately it doesn't work. Um, as Keith mentioned, or hit, uh, alluded to earlier, um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so here's the damage, if you're out in a field, uh, and um, you can look, if you pull a raceme, this one here on, on your right-hand side, or pardon me, left-hand side, um, has several galled flowers on it. That middle picture there, that was taken by Lyle Cowell up in Porcupine Plain, northeastern Saskatchewan. He suspected that this field, and you probably suspect it looking at this picture, had some economic damage. We've probably only seen a handful of fields with this kind of level uh, of damage uh, across the prairies in the last seven or eight years. Um, so I think, in a way, that's a good thing. We're not seeing a whole lot of damage. But when you do open up the, the flowers, you can see those little larvae um, there, and they're pretty tiny. Um, one thing we do know, just like a lot of species, there's a definitive edge effect. Um, so my student was looking at flowers along the edge, the num uh, number of infested or damaged flowers per 150 racemes along the edge of the field, 25 meters in, 50 meters in, or 100 meters in, and you can see we find more damaged flowers at the edge, but they are eventually kind of distributing themselves across the field and damaging it. And we did walk further into the field and we were able to um, continue to see damage across these fields well into them. So here's what I was getting at, is maybe we have the wrong common name and maybe this is an issue with common names. Um, a few years ago, uh, here in Alberta, in southern Alberta, Alan Middlestead found some larvae in pods. And he, said, he put it out on Twitter. Maybe some of you saw it and were like, what the hell is this? Um, and our, our immediate thought was, oh no, is there another species in Europe? There's another species called the Brassica pod midge, uh, which the larvae develop in uh, oilseed rake pods. Uh, we went and we sequenced these. These are actually the canola flower midge, Contronia brassicola. The fields that we found them in all appear to have hail damage. So it seems like they can't uh, attack intact pods. Those pods have to have some uh, type of damage, whether that be just ligus bug damage, piercing into the pod, 
um, some cracking um, or hail damage. Unfortunately, these, uh, when the larvae are in there, we do see some premature ripening, and so if it's not a shatter-resistant variety, we might see some loss um, due to shatter. So the, we're, we're still on the fence of whether or not the larvae is actually consuming the seed. Uh, when it's in the pod, it could just be feeding on some of that pod tissue. Okay, so what do we know about its life cycle? Um, so this is looking at the number of midge emerged in these little emergence cages. Um, so these are soil emergence cages. So just like wheat midge, this midge overwinters in the soil in a cocoon. Um, it'll then pupate in the spring. Um, and you see in this figure, just a little bump uh, in those numbers in July. This is the first generation. And then you see a much larger bump uh, in, on the figure. And that's actually the second generation. Um, and so, if you're rotating your fields, generally, you, know, you plant canola into, um, or, pardon me, so we looked at both uh, cereal fields, so that would have been canola the previous year, as well as first year canola fields, uh, and you can see, uh, as expected, we see higher numbers in those first year canola fields than we would in cereal fields. Why are they developing in cereal fields? They're just emerging uh, in, from those fields. Unfortunately, if you do plant canola and canola, we do see higher numbers, and that's that gray line uh, in the background. Interestingly enough, uh, this is very environmental dependent, just like wheat midge. Uh, in 2019, we really only saw one generation, um, this one larger uh, first generation, and then we didn't get that second bump indicating a, a large um, second generation. And so we do believe this is very, uh, it, just like wheat midge, it can vary with environmental conditions in the field. We do know that there's a couple biological control agents, so a couple parasitoids. Here's a parasitoid wasp sitting on an infested and galled flower. Um, there's two different species. Uh, this one's really cool, this Inostema species. Uh, this, like, what looks like a tail along its back is actually where the female withdraws her ovipositor. The ovipositor is that long. Um, that it's like a sheath for the ovipositor. Um, and the other one, this gastroencystis species, um, so they both uh, are widespread. They're both actually undescribed species, um, so haven't been described anywhere else in the world. They're pretty widespread. Uh, this data is a little bit old now, but uh, we found them widely across Saskatchewan. We found them in Alberta as well. I don't think we've looked in Manitoba, uh, but they're out there, and so they could be helping to regulate these populations that we're seeing in the field. We've gone on to identify the pheromone. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the details here, um, but we know it's a three component blend. Uh, these three compounds down here, I'm not gonna uh, bother saying what they are, but there's three components, and you can see there that big yellow bar that's a 10 to one to 0.5 ratio, whoops. Um, that's the most attractive. And this lure we've actually now commercialized and it's commercially available. Uh, if anybody wants to monitor it, or use it to monitor populations. And so we have monitored populations throughout the season with this lure. Um, this is starting late May, early June through to September. Um, we can find midge out there uh, in the field, and it's quite effective uh, at capturing these midge. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, currently you're probably asking, okay, what's the economic impact? Uh, we've really only found a handful of fields that had high levels of this midge. It really is like finding a needle in a haystack in most fields we're in, even though we're seeing large populations on these pheromone traps. Um, so the work's still out there. We really need to do some work uh, with cage experiments where we can manipulate the, uh, the number of midge in these, in these cages, how much damage they're causing, and really get after what kind of yield impact they could have. Uh, it's still on the fence whether this is a native versus invasive species. Uh, I think there's a lot more evidence to indicate it's a native species that's either expanded its host range or switched hosts to now use uh, canola as a host. Um, and we have a, a variety of evidence for that, and I'd be happy to chat about it. Um, so far to date, we've sent some traps actually to Ola Lunden, who you've heard from this morning, uh, in Sweden, and we've not found it there. And we're hoping to send traps out to other places throughout the world um, just to get a handle on where we can find this species and if it really is made in Canada. 
Um, all right, and then lastly, looking more at this pod damage, we really need to figure out what's the impact of this. It is not just an Alberta thing. We have found it, uh, others have found it in Saskatchewan, down near Yorkton, uh, and then also further north uh, in Saskatchewan. And so we need to get a handle on, is this midge really capable of causing damage within these pods? So both at the flowering stage and once it's potted, or is it really pre-existing damage and that this midge is then utilizing um, for, for development. All right, and with that, I do really want to thank the funders. This wouldn't have been possible without the Canola Council and the provincial, funding, and the provincial uh, canola groups, as well as WGRF, and my position at the University of Alberta is supported here uh, by most of you uh, through the Alberta Wheat, Alberta Barley, now Alberta Grains, uh, as well as Alberta Pulse and Alberta Canola. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for another excellent presentation. Um, our last presenter in this panel, before I call everyone back up for the panel discussion, is Andrea Campbell. Andrea is a PhD student at the University of Vermont. As a member of the Insect Agroecology and, and Evolution Lab, she strives to provide growers with ecologically-based management tools. Her presentation is titled, Harnessing Chemical Ecology for Swede Midge Management. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm also working with my own title today. And yes, I'm from uh, the University of Vermont working at the Insect Agroecology and Evolution Lab. I do wanna say, however, that I recently moved to Ottawa, so if anybody is in the capital region, I'm not far away. Is this my clicker? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, today I'm gonna be presenting on Swede Midge. I don't know if that's a little loud. Some of the challenges around current management techniques, um, and if we have time at the end, I'll briefly touch on just a couple of the new research directions that um, we're looking at in our lab and two additional strategies for Swede Midge management. There you go. All right, so Swede Midge is an invasive pest uh, in eastern Canada and northeastern United States. Originally from Eurasia, Swede Midge was first identified in southern Ontario in the year 2000. Since then, it has expanded its range across four Canadian provinces. Should I know you're pointing this somewhere? Sorry? One second. Oh, I'm not pressing the right one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so since then it has expanded its range across four Canadian provinces. Um, it's also in 15 states in the U.S. now. Uh, major losses have been primarily concentrated in Ontario and Quebec. Swede midge consumes all brassicas, including those in both canola and vegetable production. Uh, it's also important to note that Swede midge can live on brassica weeds, so um, those can maintain smaller populations when crops aren't available. Swede midge infestations have been devastating. We've had growers in both Canada and the US report up to 85% yield loss in some years. Uh, this is mostly in brassica vegetable production. And problematically, research into uh, broccoli plants identified or indicated that feeding from even a single larvae can reduce marketability. So growers and researchers are both finding that many aspects of Swede midge biology and ecology are making it especially challenging to manage. Um, for one, Swede midge has a cryptic feeding behavior that largely prevents foliar applications of insecticides from making contact with the larvae. Secondly, Swede midge uh, will emerge in multiple overlapping generations throughout the growing season. Uh, this can make timing of insecticide applications really challenging and can require constant monitoring throughout the season. While there is some variation in host plant susceptibility and host plant uh, preference, for the most part, host plants are extremely susceptible to damage caused by midge feeding. Uh, we can take a look at the Swede midge life cycle to highlight some of the challenges around management. Um, beginning at the soil level, Swede midge will overwinter for one to two years, 
or during active periods, so image will pupate for approximately 10 days, all within the top five centimeters of the soil. During these stages, Sweden Midge is largely protected from management strategies. Researchers have looked at solarization, ground barriers, tillage practices, and uh, nematode soil inocula inoculations. Unfortunately, none of these techniques have really resulted in very promising evidence to date. Um, there may be some potential with nematodes, but there's an additional call for long-term studies and studies that also include locally uh, native populations of nematodes. When we begin to look at the adult emergence that happens in the, sp in the spring, again, like I said, emergence will happen in three to five overlapping generations. And these overlapping generations can lead to a very uh, quick buildup of a large population. And the, again, that will require monitoring throughout an entire active, uh, and uh, require monitoring throughout the season as well as active management, um, especially for succession plantings. Also, the sweet image is very small, no more than two millimeters at the adult stage. So they're very difficult to spot in fields. Uh, we often have growers referring to them as the invisible pest, um, since growers are usually not even aware of their presence until they are seeing damage symptoms. Uh, so traditional scout and spray methods are just, they're just not practical for Sweden midge. Uh, adults also have a very short lifespan of one to five days. They do not feed during the stage, but they occupy their time with mating and egg laying. Um, our data suggests that Sweden Midge will actually mate at the site of emergence, and after which it's the mated females that are going to migrate to seek out host plants for egg laying. And this aspect of the Sweden Midge life cycle can also be challenging depending on what type of management strategy you employ. Uh, given that Sweden Midge can diapause again for one to two years, you may be having multiple um, fields that are supplying adults on farms and allowing mated females to migrate to those new plantings. Um, researchers have also looked at vertical netting barriers and insect repellents, um, or overpositioned repellents, really, to prevent egg laying and new infestations, but neither of those have been proven to be very effective. Females will lay their eggs at the growing points of their host plants, and they can lay up to 100 eggs, generally found in clusters of two to 50. The larvae will hatch in roughly one to three days, and the larval stage is the only stage that feed on host plants. Um, the feeding is concentrated at those growing tips, and this is where the larvae will secrete a digestive fluid that can break down plant tissue. Um, like we heard in the previous presentation, Sweden midge belongs to a group of flies called galling midges, and these midges have a really unique ability to manipulate plant growth, uh, generally through effector proteins that are found in their saliva. The saliva of Sweden midge has not actually been specifically studied yet, but we would not be surprised at all to find those effector proteins also in Sweden midge. And it's thought that these proteins could actually be um, part of the reason why we're seeing such significant damage from this pest. Um, also, this is the most damaging life stage of the pest, is the, is the larval stage. And it just so happens that while they're in that kind of growing tip, they're largely protected from any foliar applications. Uh, over roughly 14 days, the larvae will feed and mature and then drop to the soil for pupation or diapause. Damage symptoms from larval feeding take about a week to present, so by the time that growers are seeing the damage, the pest has already left the plant. I'm just gonna take a quick look at some of the damage symptoms that we see in condola. Um, we can see some scarring and swelling of the plant tissues. That's pretty common. Some stunted or twisted growth. Um, and the loss of the apical maricus stem or the plant growing tip can lead to compensatory branching in canola. Um, finally, we can also see a like, complete loss of elongation uh, in canola. Overall, Sweden midge infestations can severely reduce uh, yield by causing the, uh, an uneven maturation of a field. Damage symptoms are often the first indicator to growers that they may have a Sweden midge infestation. However, it is not recommended to treat a field for Sweden midge based on these symptoms alone. Um, because sweet midge is so small and rarely seen in the field, the use of pheromone baited traps is highly recommended, as is seeking an entomologist to confirm identification because the sweet midge can look pretty similar to other midges. Current best practices include monitoring all four sides of a field with one of the baited pheromone traps, um, such as the Draxon trap that is pictured here. Checking traps two to three times a week is encouraged with an active population uh, because traps could quickly influence management decisions. So while management strategies are limited, there are some current best practices. Um, 
One that I've seen really highly recommended in canola, less so in vegetable production, is planting earlier in the season. And this is why canola is most susceptible at the earlier stages of plant development uh, before flowering that you can see pictured here in the pink. Early planting of canola can really offset the timing of that plants, like when they, the offset the timing so that plants are more mature when sweet midge emerge or as the populations start to build up. For areas with large populations, we've even seen growers forgo spring plantings of brassicas altogether to have a more successful fall brassica production. Uh, we also see long, uh, long and wide rotation being advised to diminish weed midge populations in both canola and vegetable production. Uh, for long rotation, we're really looking at three years before returning brassica production to previously infested fields. Uh, with wide rotation, we're talking about three kilometers or more distance between fields, sometimes less if those fields are isolated or have a significant barrier between those fields. Both of these recommendations um, can be extremely challenging, especially from some of our smaller scale farmers that just don't have the land bases to support these recommendations. Um, again, we've seen growers forced to forgo some or all of brassica production for a period of time. Insecticides have provided some decent protection, uh, especially in conventional canola and, and conventional vegetable production. Um, to successfully reduce sweetness pressure with insecticides, however, growers need to be using a systemically translocated insecticide so that it can reach the larvae that are growing at those plant growing tips. Um, sorry, I was just gonna mention that there are some challenges with insecticidal management, uh, and that is that when the populations really build up, sometimes weekly sprays are required, can become really costly, um, but we have seen incidences of populations getting so large that even weekly sprays start to lose their effectiveness. Finally, we see insect exclusion netting. This is a strategy that is used very commonly in vegetable production. It's primarily used during periods of plant growth that are more susceptible to sweet midge. Um, growers have reported loads of frustration with it though because it can be expensive and it's also very labor intensive to use. All right, now I'll just take a minute to talk about some of the additional strategies that we're researching in our lab. Given that the most damaging life stage of sweet midge is the larval feeding stage and that there are so few strategies that can target that stage, um, we've primarily focused our efforts on looking at ways to reduce mating or lay egg laying. Uh, if you're wondering why the graphics are looking a little different here, maybe not as well as the other slides, that's because I'm responsible for them. Uh, I'm not an artist, <laughs> but we're gonna talk about pheromone mating disruption for a second. That is one strategy that has shown some promise. Um, PMD works by, or pheromone mating disruption works by releasing high amounts of a synthetic sex pheromone into a mating environment, which will, which will prevent proper chemical communication between insects um, and really reduce mate finding and subsequent mating. Uh, while we have some evidence that PMD can reduce mating in Swede midge, experiments involving field trials have varying degrees of success. So we've been looking at different aspects of the sweet midge biology and ecology to increase the efficacy of PMD. I do think it's important to say that the successful management of sweet midge, we really see it needing an integrated approach. And so PMD would needs to be seen as like a tool in a toolkit instead of an overall, like a catch-all kind of solution. Um, we also recognize that PMD systems have been quite costly um, historically. They can also be labor intensive, so a solution of this nature is gonna to need to fit within smaller profit margins and be easy to use. Um, lastly, we're also looking into a mass trapping system. Um, this is one we've really just started to look at. Mass trapping aims to capture a large number of pests right before mating or egg laying. Um, the sex pheromone that's used in pheromone mating disruption or that we also see used in the monitoring traps um, is very attractive to males and could easily be used as a bait for the mass trapping system. However, trapping only males can limit a program's success and we've seen mass trapping systems largely benefit from having an attractant for both males and females. So we've recently begun evaluating the potential for a bait um, based from host plant extracts uh, to really target female attraction, particularly the mated female sweet midge. Okay, that's it, and I think I'm running out of time too. Um, thank you all for being here and for listening. If anybody has any questions that are not answered in the next 15 minutes, please don't be afraid to reach out to me. Um, and thank you for all the sponsors and support.
Thank you. Yeah, we do have a few minutes for questions. So yeah, I'll just call up the other panelists um, to have a seat there and we'll kind of go back and forth if there's questions um, here in the room and questions online. I also have a couple just in case. So, um, who's got the first question? Over here. Okay, yeah, oh, entomologist, nice. Uh, not to be mean to my colleagues or anything. <laughs> Boyd, in your um, pheromone trapping picture, you had some sweet, or some cards there that were full of canola flower midge. What does that mean for what's actually happening in the field, just so that no one's panicked about those high numbers on the cards? That's a great question. Um, so we've tried to relate the numbers that we were catching on those cards to damage we were seeing in the field, and there's no correlation. Um, so even though we were catching thousands of midge on the cards, there were uh, usually less than 100 damaged flowers along the field edge. And that was with uh, over 100 racemes examined, um, and oftentimes a lot less. So there was no correlation, unfortunately. Just a quick question on Swede Mitch. Uh, oh, I can only remember the last presentation. Sorry, it was a great day. Um, in Ontario, there's a interest in uh, more interest in winter canola. We've got currently we sell a lot of spring canola out there. Is there a different appetite for Swede Mitch for winter versus spring? I'm actually wondering if Boyd might be better equipped to answer this question. More familiar with canola production in Ontario. Sure, I can take a stab at it. Um, it does affect uh, winter canola as well. Um, as you heard earlier today, it's the dominant oilseed rape is dom winter oilseed rape is dominant in Europe, and Swede midge can be uh, an issue in Europe, but usually it's not. Um, it's kind of one that falls off the radar, I'd say, uh, in Europe in terms of uh, oilseed rape pests. Um, but when we've been looking at Unfortunately, when we've been looking at the host plant range of Swede midge uh, and different life, uh, uh, phenological stages of the plant, it can almost attack anything. It's, it's pretty impressive for being such a specialized uh, insect. Um, the canola, as mentioned earlier, we've, it, it's really from the two leaf stage onwards, uh, it can be infested uh, until even pods are forming. And if you have a lot of secondary branches or tertiary branches, those can all be infested too. Uh, so sweet midge, unfortunately, we can't get around it with, with winter canola. So. A uh, question from on the online audience, Courtney. Yeah, there's a question for Tyler. Is there a seed treatment that works well on aster leafhoppers? Okay, so I'm glad you asked that question because it ties into the question of what happened in 2012 when canola was trashed by aster yellows. What happened this year, 2023, where it really wasn't touched that well, but the leafhoppers were out there. So Bob Elliott, retired uh, AAFC, Christelle Olivier moved up into management. They actually did that work. Uh, they couldn't publish it for five years because of uh, you know agreements with companies, but seed treatments on canola kill leafhoppers and prevent transmission of aster yellows. So that is a great question. So the current seed treatments like I was telling you about putting those things in the freezer, these things are sensitive to a lot of things, including the neonicotinoid seed treatments. And so the difference between 2012 and 2023 was probably the spring environment. So Janet Nodal mentioned in, uh, in her talk about the seed treatments not really working too well under cool, wet conditions, right? The, Plant stayed small, and this is what happened in 2012. Plant stayed small, it was cool, it was wet in the spring, and all of a sudden, Aster yellows six weeks later. And uh, yeah, so I didn't say that in my talk, but I was hoping to sort of leave that open ended for questions. So thank you. One more over here, yeah. Yeah, so pollen beetle and Swede midge, so far we haven't identified in the prairies in the major canola growing belt. The, um, the boreal shield um, of northern, northwestern Ontario seems to have, have worked so far at keeping them at bay. Just wondering about 
what your predictions are as for how long we can rely on that before we'll actually start finding these pests on the prairies. It's on? Okay. Um, right now, I think they, they, they are in Quebec. So as soon as they start to reach Ontario, then I would start to get worried about it moving further west. For now, it's it's just in Quebec. Um, I think with, with climate change, they are going to move because they moved from from uh, the Atlantic from, from uh, Nova Scotia to, to Quebec. They're there now and they're in high numbers. So I, I would say, you know, like it, it won't be long before they, before they start to move. But if we can stop them, right? So we could find ways to stop them and keep populations down. Um, and that's what most of my work was to try and figure out ways to keep the population down so that it's when the populations get really high that you will see movement. Um, for sweet midge, uh, climatic modeling has really identified uh, rainfall being one of the largest kind of predictors of new establishments. So as long as we're not seeing an increase there, um, hopefully we'll see a similar lack of increase in range. Tyler, this is a question for Tyler. Have you, uh, have you done any work with foliar uh, insecticides with, with the leafhoppers? Up in Swan Valley, it was really thick in the wheat. And it was like uh, right at herbicide time. So I had a bunch of guys threw it in some desis with it and it did thin out the next generation, but it, I have no data to say it helped or anything like that, but it, it didn't seem like when they, when they arrived, they were attracted to the wheat and there were just like snow in there. But I'm just wondering if there's any data that points towards that's effective or not. Okay. So, you're talking about some future research there for me, okay? This is what we do when the leafhoppers show up, or what can we do? Keith Gobert says that to me all the time. Okay, Tyler, what are we gonna do? And uh, like you said, they were in the wheat. They are, they reproduce, they feed in cereals. So for them to come into canola, um, my question, I guess, to you is, what did the Astra yellows look like in the canola around those wheat fields that you sprayed? It wasn't, very, wasn't as bad as I was, like it, it looked very familiar to 2012. Like everyone was freaking out actually because it, <laughs> it was pretty thick up in there. So guys are you, were just- Are you talking, I'm asking the symptoms in the canola. Yeah. The symptoms the, were the, the symptoms weren't as bad as 2012. Okay, even around the fields where the leaf hoppers were sprayed in the wheat? Even around the fields, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Hmm, maybe I don't need to study that then. Wow. Now that's a great question, and uh, yeah, we need the big fields to do this kind of research, right? Um, and I'll just have to say that if you look on the labels, the only thing that's registered is in canola for flea beetle, con or for the leafhopper control, right? And so, Will it work on leaf hoppers? I'm pretty sure that they're sensitive to all insecticides. Is it registered? Not in the crop, right? But maybe it should be. Not on, we're gonna go back to Clint's question real quick. Um, Swede midge has been found as far west as Minnesota uh, in uh, like a market garden right in, um, right in the Twin Cities area. Um, Janet has been monitoring for Swede Midge in North Dakota for a number of years. This past year, they actually sent me some samples thinking they might have Swede Midge. Uh, luckily, it was not. Um, so we have seen that westward creep in the U.S. If it gets to, if it gets to North Dakota, I think we're going to get it. Uh, I agree, though. I think it is, it's very weather dependent. Um, but we'll see. It, 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 unfortunately, Swede Midge was a regulated pest when it was deregulated. We saw a huge expansion kind of right away um, from Nebraska vegetable production, and we've seen that creeping west. And I know they're, they're worried about it even in California and the U.S., and they're potentially doing some research down there just in case it gets into their vegetable production in that region. So they're worried about the potential spread. Okay, we'll take one last question, then we'll have to... 
Yeah, uh, this question is for Tyler. Um, when I was looking at your, your map, uh, where, where it shows uh, the, um, the migration of uh, leaf hoppers, it's like Saskatchewan is the destination. What's happening in Alberta and, uh, and, um, and, and Manitoba uh, in terms of uh, leaf hoppers and, uh, and Asa yellows? Uh, they are no monitoring. They are not monitoring there. Or Saskatchewan is the a good destination for them. Patrick, that's a great question, and it's uh, it's because that project was very Saskatchewan centric, <laughs> with me living there, and doing the work, and needing to drive out and get all of those sites. So what I will tell you is that uh, the wind patterns are different and can be different. So often Alberta will get different wind patterns than Saskatchewan, but Saskatchewan and Manitoba will often get the same wind patterns. And so some of the really hot Astra Yellows fields this year were in Manitoba, and we were getting large numbers of leafhoppers, and they were very infected out of Manitoba. And the cut flower growers that I was talking about were up in northern Alberta. And so we obviously had a migration that went into northern Alberta as well. And so Shelley Barkley in Alberta has been helping me out um, with some sweeping, and John Gavlowski as well in Manitoba will send me leaf hoppers, and so, but most of the sampling is being done in Saskatchewan, and so this is why we've got those first arrivals, and the first arrivals are what we're using to backtrack those winds, and so we've got them in Saskatchewan. For example, on the 22nd of May this year, there were no leaf hoppers. On the 23rd of May, there were leaf hoppers, so then we can pinpoint those, those biofix dates and then go back in time and see where the winds came from using a few other variables. So good question. And I'll just wrap it up with, yeah, it was a Sask-centered project, so. Thanks everyone. Sorry, I have to uh, shut it down now, but we are a little bit over time already. So please join me in thanking our panelists and speakers. Head off the stage with me. And I will turn it over to Keith Gobert for a final wrap up of today. Microphone back. Sure. Thanks, Taryn, and those last group of speakers. Looks like we've had a, a fantastic day. I really enjoyed it. I have a couple housekeeping things that I've, people more organized than myself have pointed out to me, so I'll just go through those. Uh, again, a big thank you to our sponsors. We just can't do this, uh, do this day without you. Thanks so much to Taryn and everyone here and those people that were online and joined us today. Uh, this concludes day two of Canola Week. That's a big white shirt on that screen. <laughs> I can see my arms move even when I'm not, not watching. Um, those of you that attended virtually uh, can collect CCA credits. Please watch the screen after this and you can scan that QR code. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet just around at the registration table. If you're more into manual uh, signing, we have to submit those uh, if you do sign your name there. Or you can also scan that code uh, at the door as you're leaving. For those of you that are wondering, this is pre-recorded and this recording will be available sometime in the new year. Um, most importantly, likely for, uh, for many of you, I think I can see thirsty folks in the crowd, uh, BSF is pleased to host an Invigor cocktail hour next door until 5.30, so please join us there and make your way over there. Again, important details for tomorrow morning. Breakfast, because we are starting a little earlier, is from 7.30 to 8.30 in this room. Uh, opening remarks will commence at 8.30. Uh, also note that if you're checking out tomorrow, Thursday, uh, the hotel has a storage room for, for luggage. If, you're, uh, if you need, need somewhere to put your bags, uh, just ask to get the front desk uh, and they'll take care of you for that. Uh, there is complimentary parking for those of you that attended Canola Week. If you haven't figured out what to do with your car yet, um, you should have figured that out in downtown Calgary. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention and be sure to see you next door. Uh, BSF is a platinum sponsor and as I said, they have the Invigor cocktail hour to, uh, to entertain you for the next little while. Again, thank you, and uh, I hope you enjoy day three.